<clears throat> okay, hi everyone, how are you? So today uh, we're going to have a last uh, lecture. And as I announced, uh, the exam file, uh, like the meeting, exam file will be uploaded by as late as uh, next Friday. Uh, but uh, there is a chance that actually that the exam file can be uploaded a little earlier than uh, next Friday. Uh, but in any case, the <coughs> announcement will be posted so that you can uh, you can't really miss it. And you are going to have one full week uh, to submit, just like the old times. Okay. So, uh, and the exam will cover the, until that we cover today, the material, after the midterm, till now. Okay. The, the coverage of the exam question will be just like that. So, okay, so let's continue. On this flow of genetic uh, information today, uh, this is something that the yeah, old story, uh, assuming that everybody knows about these things, DNA, RNA protein, as I uh, several times emphasized, uh, try to uh, <coughs> explain uh, with some examples and with uh, some analogy like that. So, uh, so in here, the actual, our main goal is to the, the, the reason, the only reason why we uh, value the DNA so much is that it is really the starting point and the information itself for what? Generating this protein and what really works as a, like functioning as a workhorse to uh, enabling everything we need in our life is actually the protein and What's the role of this RNA? Like a uh, middleman, pick up some necessary information written on DNA and deliver, uh, and present to who? The ribosome. Ribosome is the machinery, okay? Assembling uh, each different, 20 different amino acids to make specific protein. Then we uh, <coughs> use those specific protein to uh, uh, engage in cellular, uh, different cellular functions. So this is the direction of the flow of information, which adopt, which was dubbed as a central dogma of uh, a, the flow of information, DNA. Always this information uh, goes from DNA to RNA and to protein. The point is you can't. Why this is something called a dogma is because maybe in some occasion you might want to actually, hey, how about, I don't want this, always this direction of the flow of the information. So what about, I want to go from here, can I go backward, starting from protein to make RNA, and then once you make the RNA, can I make DNA out of RNA? So can I violate what about what dogma? So this is called the central dogma. The flow of information always goes from DNA to RNA to protein is what central dogma says. And so, who cares about central dogma? I want to violate. But no, you can't. Is That's why uh, it earned its name dogma. Okay? So it always flows from DNA to RNA to protein. You cannot go backwards, is what it is. However, 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 however. That's, there is one uh, notorious living organism can freely violate this central dogma, at least at this level. This particular virus can uh, make DNA from starting from RNA to this, some viruses. Like uh, one example of such virus is uh, AIDS virus, HIV virus. Because HIV virus like so certain kind of uh, peculiar virus 
uh, their genome, their genome consists of RNA, unlike most of the living organism, or DNA is uh, our genetic material. But for them, RNA is their genetic material. And like viruses are what? It's a parasite. It's a parasite is come in to the host cell like animal or plant, and they convert their genome because the host cell's genome is DNA. And viruses' genome is RNA. It's not compatible. As a parasite, they have to rely on all those cellular machinery, everything. So they better, they have, they better mimic the genome into our host genome, which is DNA. So they have evolved this mechanism. They can make DNA from RNA, which seems which we thought for a long time is impossible. That's why we just put this as a central dogma, or whatever. You always have to go from DNA to RNA. You cannot go backward. But these viruses are they're laughing. They've been laughing at us. What's central dogma? We can, we can go backward. So they come in. They infect us in the form of RNA. And then inside of our host cell, they convert their genome into DNA. So what does it take? It's an RNA virus. RNA is a single strand, right? DNA is, on the other hand, a double strand. So it involves, they have to convert their single-stranded RNA into double-stranded DNA, and then sneak into, so like, if this was a RNA, virus RNA, then come inside a host cell, and they switch into double strand DNA. Wow! And our chromosome, and then. They insert their genome into our, and then they just live as if. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, one anecdote about this central dogma thing is, this is actually in reality is not dogma anymore. A lot of things, even synthetically in these days. Ooh, wow. I'm not that old. <laughs> oh. Today I said about uh, <laughs> Bang Man One about <laughs> great. So uh, some scientists actually uh, start with a protein. They can even demonstrate. They even demonstrated a uh, generation of RNA into DNA. So in these days, this is not uh, really some uh, really significant uh, matter. But anyway. That's traditionally has been that way that you can't, you can't go backward. Uh, it always flows like this was originally uh, dubbed as central dogma thing. So anyway, uh, so this thing, whole thing is, another question is uh, how is the question? Okay, fine. DNA, present some, like allow some copying to the RNA, in the form of RNA. And then, but the, the main question is how do you do this? This RNA, up until this point, RNA is simply only the information, code. Protein is a real tangible thing. How do you convert this thing? First you start off like language, okay? And then you have to be able to recognize and understand. That's why it is called translation. So this process, conversion of RNA from DNA is called a transcription, as I mentioned earlier, transcription, because it is simply copying your original record. Okay? Remember, I like uh, compare this thing with uh, you try to get uh, your record of academic record from your registrar's office, like, uh, can I have a transcript? Uh, then, then they allow you to have only the copy, original 
is always there. Like, but what about here? So this is only still the information. Hey, information and and this is a real thing. So this is called translation. That's why translation, like interpret. So you have all unrecognizable, some kind of a alphabet, jumbles of alphabet sentences. And in order to build the actual tangible workers, you have to be able to understand, translate, okay, understand what it means. Okay. And this ribosome thing can translate this, understand this language. And then according to this protocol, okay, how to assemble, or according to this recipe, uh, whichever you like to use, protocol or recipe, to how to build this protein, like how to make pizza. Okay, you need some dough and you need some like a pepperoni and you bake uh, for how long type of things. And that's what this ribosome can do. So, uh, so here involves some specific rule. Okay. So DNA is what? Four letter alphabets. So with four letter, a combination of these four letter, A, G, C, T, four different nucleotides, you just create whatever you want to, some kind of a specific vocabulary. Okay. With those vocabulary, you just create some sentences. So uh, how do you do that? So you have only four alphabet, and then you decide to use, in order to generate one specific word, vocabulary, your rule is to pick any three alphabet. And then, hey, this is like some kind of word. So that's uh, what we call the codon. So definition, official definition of the codon is this, the sets of a three nucleotide, three nucleotide. You have only four nucleotides, four different kinds of nucleotide, and you pick three, any three out of four. How many different ways you can you pick three, three out of four? Think about it. How many different ways can you do this? Freedom. You have a four different nucleotide in order. Okay. Then uh, your task is uh, you need to pick one and another one, another one, three consecutive alphabet consecutive nucleotide to make this alphabet of a nucleotide unique. How many different ways can you do this? You have three alphabet. I mean, four alphabet. What am I talking about? First, second, third. And this is, by definition, a codon, a set of codon, three nucleotides. The first one, how many different ways you can you put? You have a four nucleotide. So you have a four different possibilities. Either A, G, C, T, okay? Four different, so you have four. For the second nucleotide, how many different ways can you? Again, four. Third one, again, four. So all together, Sixty-four different possibilities to create different combination of this whatever the codon is. So, in other words, in DNA world, okay, you have up to maximum sixty-four different words vocabularies. Okay, so using only sixty-four different vocabularies, you are to generate any possible sentences, which is the combination of this each vocabulary, which each this vocabulary stands for what? Potentially stands for single different amino acid. So this nucleotide, three different combination of whatever the nucleotide, each of which will code, designate different amino acid. But here, the, uh, the you may immediately have questions. Hey, we have only 20 amino acids, right? 
in building protein, how many different kinds of amino acids uh, do we put in? Only 20 different amino acids. It's not that, I'm not saying that there are only 20 different amino acids in the whole world. Yeah, there are more than probably hundreds different, several hundreds different amino acids can be possible. However, for some reason, originally in our cell, only 20 specific amino acids participate in this business of protein assembly. So in other words, we have excess, more than enough redundant code. So we have enough of this. We don't worry about, hey, we only have 64 different vocabulary. How is it enough to make all kinds of different protein? Don't you worry. We have already exceeding what we really need. Because one for you, each, all you got to do, all you need, after all, is one for each amino or uh, different amino acids. So uh, theoretically speaking, you would need only 20 different kinds of code dons you need. But in reality, what you can generate maximum possibly is a 64. So we have more than enough already. Okay, good. So that's what I have just said. So several different, for example, AUG, like for example, AUG, why there is a U? Because it's like, by definition, it's on the RNA. So instead of T, U. So AUG, these are three specific combination of a codone designate this particular amino acid. Happens to be methionine. By convention, instead of uh, giving the full name of amino or different amino acid, we just abbreviated with the three letters, or in some cases only single letter. But who cares? That's not really important. So in this way, Many different, so GGG, glycine, CCC, proline, ACG, threonine, kind of, all different, uh, like a coding, different code, specific, uh, specify different amino acids is what uh, it is right now. So here we are. So this DNA double strand, Double strand DNA, and there are two different DNA is double strand. Only one of the two will serve as the original this template. Okay, right. Template means the sequence of template DNA will be what? Parenthesis. Complementary to messenger RNA, isn't it? So. If template DNA strand happens to be T, then messenger RNA, corresponding messenger RNA sequence will be A and G, C, A, U, like that. That's thing. And so on the mRNA, we read three by three. So each three such nucleotide on the mRNA serve as a specific codon, which means ACU, if uh, that happens to be ACU, then it will designate specific amino acid, which is a threonine, just like that. But still, still you are not probably satisfied. How? Right? Okay, fine. Three different nucleotides will specify each different amino acid, but how exactly? In reality, these three, uh, whenever any particular combination of three nucleotides pop up, then it will automatically will be converted into specific amino acid. Obviously, that's not. Amino acid is amino acid, and nucleotide is a nucleotide. Totally different thing. Then how do you like just because you have three specific combination of a, a nucleotide? Uh, how do you actually make this particular amino acid come over here? So what it takes is, after all, uh, proteins are nothing but assembly of different pro amino acids. 
So if you happen to combine this, 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 this somehow, then it becomes a one single protein. But this aura, amino acid aura, particularly, oh, this, this, that, 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 is a specific sequence of amino acid. Is what? Determined by what? This guy. If this particular codon sequence is present originally in the DNA, then as a consequence, specific amino acid will be assembled. So that's how we, like, that's the real uh, relationship. DNA will determine ultimately what kind of protein will be made. Now, but still, how, just because you have this specific uh, codon, how do you bring this specific amino acid to connect each of these particular different amino acid so that specific protein can be made? Here comes the another type of RNA, which is a uh, transfer RNA. Before we do that, let's just, uh, if you happen to kind of uh, concerned, to be concerned about, uh, we have only 20 amino acid and codons are 64. So isn't it too much of a waste? Like we have uh, too much waste, excess of this codon for only uh, designating 20 different amino acids if you somehow happen to think that way, then think again, because uh, then obviously the way you can reduce this excess waste of a codon is uh, to reduce this uh, the number of nucleotide used in a single codon. So instead of using three, how about using two? But immediately you fall into the problem if you do that. Then the total Maximum, you can only cover 16 different amino acids, which is not enough for two or 20 different. So three is just a bare minimum. Three nucleotide, using three nucleotide to designate single amino acid as in the codon, as a codon, is just a bare minimum to cover 20 amino acids. Although, although you have such a waste, huge access that you don't really necessarily need, but there is no other choice. That's life. That's why you have a three uh, nucleotide codon uh, still have it in your cell. Okay. So now we can move on to this concept of anti-codon. There is a codon and there is an anti-codon. And the relationship between codon and anti-codon is, guess what? Anybody can guess? Let me give you a hint. The relationship between template DNA and messenger RNA is what? Complementary. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Complementary. So the relationship between the template DNA sequence and the messenger RNA is always a complementary, right? Complementary. That's the secret of this the whole DNA thing. It's very simple secret. And once again, the relationship between codon and anti-codon is once again complementary. What's the beauty of this complementary? Why cell loves to rely on this same old complementary relationship? Why? Please? <laughs> Please, bonus one point then. One point bonus. <laughs> Please. Why sell? I mean, what do you, what's the benefit? What's the advantage of relying on this whole, whole this relationship is complementary? So what do you get if you, uh, if you use this complementary thing?
Yeah, fine. Who are you? Huh? Shida. Okay, Shida. Got you. Yeah, complementary thing can bind. So that's why RNA doesn't, without worrying about missing things, but complementary things is really reliable connection binding. Between complementary nucleotide, they always they can bind. Okay? Click, click, click. And you can detach this bound complementary easily. Okay? There are several easy ways. Same, once, once again, if you have a codon, and if there is an, uh, something called anticodon, then this codon and anticodon can also bind. That means, Bind means they can physically come together very near. Bind is, the beauty of binding is these two parties can come to close enough. That's the beauty of this binding. So, if that is the case, what's the T, uh, do you still remember the function of tRNA? Messenger RNA is something that carries the information actually as a codon. So, the only Messenger RNA, only messenger RNA can bear this something called codon, right? Because messenger RNA is the only one that deliver this actual, the information, the messages. What about the ribosomal RNA? Ribosomal RNA's function is what? Component of big ribosome, right? Then there were another type of RNA, tRNA, transfer RNA. What's the function? Do you still remember? The function of a tRNA? Transfer RNA? Anybody? Function of a tRNA? It can bring, it can bring each different amino acid. So in other words, how many different type of tRNA would there be in our cell? At least. 20, at least. Yeah, at least we should have 20 different tRNA so that each tRNA can cover each of different uh, amino acids they can pick up and deliver. That's the function. That's the job of transfer RNA. Now, the question is, if the codon and anticodon's relationship is complementary, then where would you rather put this information, whatever it is, the anticodon, where would you put it? Where particularly would you put them? It would be uh, really, really helpful in this business of assembling amino acid. According to, according to the information on the messenger. Am I just making the, the simple thing is unnecessarily difficult? If Anticodon present on tRNA somewhere, then specific tRNA can bind to specific messenger RNA. Can they? Codon and anticodons are what? Complementary. And there is specific codon. And there is a specific anticodon sequence, three nucleotide. If this specific anticodon sequence happens to be present on tRNA, then each different tRNA can find each of partner codon and then bind. That's the principle of this protein synthesis. Once you have, like, once you have this specific codon, right? Specific codon. Specific codon. Then you have specific amino acid, each of which have this some specific re relationship. The mechanism by which each specific amino acid can somehow connect to each different codon is because transfer RNA. Each different transfer RNA has a specific anticodon, unique anticodon. So that means if ACU the anticodon of ACU is UGA. So transfer RNA happens to have this specific anticodon, will combine, will recognize and bind to this. 
And as a consequence, this amino acid will come over here. And CCU, this particular codon's anticodon is a GGA. And this particular anticodon sequence is, on the pre uh, is present on specific transfer RNA, and that transfer RNA happens to carry this particular amino acid. So this transfer RNA recognizes this and then bind. And as a consequence, this particular amino acid will come onto this exact particular position. And that's how you determine specific order of amino acid. And actually, this specific amino acid can actually come over here, and then they can be assembled. That's how it's all done, the protein synthesis. And this is real uh, shape of a molecular model of the transfer RNA, how it uh, looks like. And this is at the end. Okay? This is uh, where uh, specific amino acid, one amino acid is attached. Okay? And the location of the anticodon is uh, over here. Oh, shit. What's it? Over here. Okay? Got it? So, this particular site can combine, recognize and combine a specific three nucleotide codon, and as a consequence, this particular amino acid can go to that particular site. And if you just continue on this, then the specific sequence of amino acid is made, and that's a specific protein. Okay. So, each tRNA carries a single anticodon, and the type of amino acid carried by it is determined accordingly. Uh, hopefully, you can understand by now. Now, the thing is, there are, uh, instead of only 20 different uh, transfer RNA, uh, there are 61 different tRNAs, actually. There are 61 different tRNAs are there in our cell. Not 64, but 61 for some reason. And, but all we need is actually a different kind of a 20, uh, amino acid is only 20. That means some, some tRNAs are actually are redundant. Different tRNA carry the same kind of amino acid. We have some kind of excess redundant transfer RNA kinds. But anyway, uh, the more is better than uh, less. So we don't uh, really get to worry about. But still, uh, a little mind-boggling thing is why 61? Like, if there's some of 64, somehow understandable, because a 64 is uh, the number of codons, maximum codons. But is a 61? Or is it something coincidence or there is uh, some uh, hidden agenda reason behind this only 61? Let's find out. Uh, so these are all really like organized codon, so-called codon table, uh, which you don't really have to worry about. But anyway, like there are three different positions of a first the U and the second position U and the third position is uh, something like that, and specific amino acids will be determined like that. So in reality, if you want to know uh, what specific codon uh, specify a uh, particular amino acid, then you go back and refer this uh, codon table as a like a major. Uh, but obviously, you don't have to worry about as a non-major. Uh, there is no uh, like a, I don't really uh, think any particular occasion that you need to uh, try to find the codon table. So it's totally uh, it's none of your business. And this is how actually uh, it's done. Although it looks complicated, but once you understand, then it's, so, it's not really that complicated. It's that then uh, as a reward, you actually understand how the protein synthesis is done. Uh, so let's see. This is what? Ribosome. 
And this is what? Messenger RNA. In other words, ribosome scan messenger RNA. And then ribosome will move okay, from the start to the end of a particular messenger RNA. Ribosome can move. And what did I say about the ribosome? Ribosome is the machinery that assembles amino acid. So that's why we call ribosome as a, like functions of ribosome is a protein synthesis. How does it do? How does this ribosome uh, make this protein synthesis work? Uh, don't worry about this thing. Once, uh, important point, characteristic of ribosome is this. Ribosome has a two space, separate chambers. In reality, there are three, but uh, for simplicity, let's only uh, for, let's say there are only two spaces. Each space is for coming and sitting particular uh, transfer RNA. What kind of transfer RNA can come and then occupy this will be totally determined by what? It is a simple but very important question. So this ribosome has a two empty, originally, initially two empty chambers. Each chamber, uh, particular transfer RNA can come and occupy that space, the chamber. But in reality, what particular type of, we have a 61 different transfer RNA, right? What type of transfer RNA can come and then occupy particular uh, chamber of ribosome is in reality will be strictly determined by what? Determined by this. Because this is what codon. And the only way, the only way a particular transfer RNA can come and then stably stay is if they are complementary. So if, let's say, this ribosome scan. Yeah? So the first, while this ribosome scan, the first codon that ribosome encounter is AUG. Okay? Then the first transfer RNA that can come and then combine with this AUG will be the one having anticodon of this thing. So, Exactly, automatically, what kind of amino acid will come for the, uh, for the first time will be strictly determined by this. What do you have here? And the, the next one, then is, I, I hope it's easier. Then what would be the next amino acid will come over here? Will strictly determined by what? What kind of codon do you have over here, right? So exactly whatever it is, the transfer RNA having the anticodon sequence to this particular codon will only and only can can come to this empty uh, space chamber and then bind. So, so this is what happens. So these two chambers are all filled. The rooms are full. Okay, no more customers. While they are together, what's going to happen? If these two transfer RNAs are like sitting side by side, then each transfer RNA carry what? Amino acid. These two transfer uh, to these two amino acid can be connected over here. That's how you assemble the amino acid. And the job is accomplished. Then this ribosome will move one step further to this position. And that if this ribosome move this direction, then what's going to happen? This one will be kicked out because it moves this one, then this, there's no one, no, no room left. So this amino acid A is kicked out. Now this amino acid B will be moved to this uh, previously, the site of the chamber that A Occupy, was occupying, and then now you have one more empty space available, 
and this empty space, the another amino acid can come to fill it, and then continue on this assembly thing. That's how you uh, grow this chain of amino acid till the end. When? Now, when this happened. This codon, this particular codon, is called the stop codon. This is something particular. Remember, we have 64 codons. But out of 64, 61 codon have, each of the 61 codon has its own partner with transfer RNA. Right? Remember, there are 61 transfer RNAs. Each transfer RNA will have particular anticodon. We have a codon, 64. In other words, there are three transfer RNA missing. In other words, three codons out of the 64 do not have any partner, particular transfer RNA partners. In other words, if those three, uh, those three codons are called stop codon. So by definition, stop codons are nothing but that those codons that doesn't have any partnering anticodon because there is no transfer RNA corresponding that for some reason. There are only 61 transfer RNA, whereas there are 64 codons. Three are missing. And those three missing are what? You all have to memorize this, right? You are, you got, you are, uh, these three particular combination of codons do not have a corresponding anticodon because there are uh, no corresponding tRNA. And whenever either one of these three codons is encountered with, then you don't have any transfer RNA that can come and then fill, right? That's how you stop. Oh, I don't have any partner. This ribosome is moderately patient. Yeah, maybe they will come eventually. So I will wait, like maybe five seconds or 10 seconds. Now it becomes annoyed. Hey, how many, how, how much longer do I have to wait? So at the 10 seconds or 20 seconds, uh, no one is still coming. Then I will, just, I will quit and go home there. That's how you end the particular uh, protein synthesis. And that's the role of this stop codon. Stop codons, uh, there is no matching transfer RNA, so you cannot go further. You cannot continue on adding on the new transfer RNA and then assemble this uh, amino acid. So that's the end point of this translation. If you understood all these things, then you're great. Okay, uh, so that's not really that much complicated. It's not a rocket science. Uh, science. It's easy to understand uh, this whole mechanism of translation. Okay, so, oh, I'm afraid uh, I have a really a bad feeling that our today's lecture is going to end early. Because we are already reaching heating and the mutation, and that's all. This is the final. This is the final uh, section of the discussion. So once you, we are done with this mutation discussion, we, and we don't have any more. So let's yeah, let's try. Or should I actually drag on something to uh, uh, finish, like go on up until like something like eight o'clock? I don't know. So anyway, mutation by definition. By the way. Oh, where are, where are you? This, this white crocodile, this thanks to the muta uh, mutation of the gene on this pigment on the skin color. That's why somehow uh, instead of that uh, brown, brownish skin color or crocodile or alligator or whatever, uh, that turns out to be this wild uh, albino uh, alligator. 
So definition of this mutation is what? DNA sequence change. And not all those DNA sequence change actually uh, have any uh, effect, meaningful effect. So in particular, usually by convention, the, as a consequence of a specific DNA sequence change, then if you have some specific consequences in the function, okay, or property of a gene, then we call it as a mutation. Three different types of, on the smaller scale, three different types of mutation we can think of. One is a substitution and deletion in an instance. In terms of a nucleotide level, right? Substitution, you know what it is, substitution. Okay? Inserting, trying to sneak in, unauthorized one, sneak into here. Like for example, we have something like a 20 something students over here. And we supposed to, we're supposed to have something like 50 student, but anyway, that's all, okay. But anyway, one extra student can uh, come over and sitting. Uh, can, I don't even recognize who you are, but you're sitting and then uh, having this, enjoying this lecture, then that's a substitution. No, that's not a substitution, but instead one student has to run away. So like switching, switching one student and as a substitution. Deletion is without any further notice, one is missing. And insertion is unauthorized uh, addition. Fine. So at each level, this substitution, if there is a substitution, then there is a, a possibility of, at this point of a substitution, uh, because the codon change, then originally it was like GGC codon, but because of this presence of additional uh, change, then this identity can be switched into something different. Deletion also uh, can affect this identity of a uh, codon and as a result, the resulting resultant amino acid identity too, right? But in particular, because codons consist of Codon uh, is made up of a three nucleotide. So especially substitutions is uh, sometimes can be okay because substitution after all, uh, something has to be present, but it's gone. But instead of me, somebody else is like, uh, okay, uh, working for me. So a lot of times substitution itself may have a lesser impact, but Deletion or insertion is a more of a serious problem because something is missing entirely or something is uh, added on or without any intention, our original intention. But in particular, especially among those deletion or insertion, uh, you can have deletion of one nucleotide or two nucleotide at a time or three nucleotide at a time altogether. And so is the case of insertion. But especially this deletion of or insertion of one or two nucleotide at a time uh, has a greater, greater, greater consequences, more serious uh, consequences usually, which is we call a frame shift of the reading frame. So here, uh, what? what is a frame shift and what is a reading frame? is probably the something that uh, is not pleasant for you. Okay, first, uh, let me introduce what reading frame is. If we like uh, consider this whole thing is a vocabulary of a three alphabet, which is basically what it is like. So, hey, so this is also, this sentence also, made up of all three different alphabet, and each of alphabet present particular vocabulary. So you try to read this. The red dog ate the cat. Okay. Three alphabet, three alphabet, three alphabet, just like codon. So it makes perfect sense. You know what it is. 
the red dog ate the cat. So if we compare this, each of this vocabulary as a different amino acid, and this whole sentence makes some perfect uh, protein, which makes sense. However, frame shift is what happened. A kind of frame shift occurred. And then you try to read this now. Can you read this? The rat got that act up. Is that correct? What does that mean? Totally doesn't make any sense. That's what happened. What happened here? Can you diagnose what happened? What happened? Huh? Yeah. This E was deleted. And just one nucleotide, let's just uh, consider this as a uh, kind of nucleotide. One nucleotide is deleted right now. And totally correct. This is a correct reading frame. You read three letters. Okay? One by one, you read three and three and three, and that's how you move on in, in, in this cold on world. So you have a correct reading frame, which originally you uh, somehow happened to read three nucleotide by three nucleotide, and due to this missing single nucleotide, you are missing two. Nucleotide, the next one is combined to this original three nucleotide thing, and all together this whole thing was messed, okay, out of order became. So one after this point of uh, the deletion, everything became disastrous. So this is something, one example of such a frame shift. How dangerous, how deleterious uh, the frame shift mutation would be. And why this thing? Uh, if, for example, uh, If you somehow entirely delete three letters all together, then see what happened. And then you try to read this. Then, instead of uh, without red, you can read, the dog ate the cat. Yeah, it is something slightly different from original meaning, but still it makes sense. And so it is usually in the protein world. Somehow, if this deletion uh, happened in the scale of a three nucleotide altogether, that means you all, all you missed is one, one, new, uh, one amino acid deleted out. And the rest of the whole thing may, that there is a really higher chance for the rest of this whole amino acid can function normally for a particular protein. Your impact, just because you don't have this red anymore, this uh, particular vocabulary anymore, uh, still uh, overall, this whole sentence still makes sense. That's what. But if you somehow uh, do this exercises deletion at the scale of single nucleotide or two nucleotide, then the frame shift occurred. But three nucleotide, you don't have any frame shift. Frame did not shift. Frame was preserved. The reading frame, original reading frame, still preserved. And as a consequence, probably the effect of this mutation uh, is uh, like chances are, uh, could be minimal. But instead, if you had this insertion or deletion in two or one, nucleotide scale, then frame shift definitely will occur, and the consequence would be uh, probably more dangerous. In, in the case of what? Here, what happened? One nucleotide inserted over here still doesn't make any sense, right? The frame shift also had occurred. Nonsense mutation, premature stop, and missense mutation, wrong code on I made. Okay, I will not. 
I mean, I will not uh, hold you responsible for distinguish this uh, nonsense versus misense this semester, okay? because uh, I became no better. Those trivial miscellaneous things is not really a, a big deal of it. Mutations are just a mutation at this level. Uh, okay, but this one is something uh, worth noticing. The silent mutation, on the other hand, usually, usually, mostly, this silent mutation occurs when there is a substitution. Substitution. Substitu substitution is probably uh, most benign because. One is missing, but instead of another one is coming, came to this exact place. So usually substitution is a safer. I'm not saying it will always be safe, but it's a safer. Okay. And among those are substitution, usually, uh, still, you don't even have, uh, suffer any consequences at all. On what occasion would that be? Is two reasons. Uh, one obvious reason uh, is this substitu substitution sometimes can result uh, uh, the may result in no not even no change in the amino acid identity even in some cases or some other times it may result in some amino acid identity change, but still, in terms of the functionality, you don't really have any differences. On one occasion, you will have the no change in the amino acid identity, because due to this 64 thing versus 20 amino acid, Certain codons are redundantly used to designate exact same amino acid. So, in other words, both AAG, AAA, both of them code for same lysine amino acid. So, if this, the three, the last position of the nucleotide is somehow substituted into something else, like this, still exactly the same. Amino acid can result on that occasion. So basically, what we can say is codons are redundant. Especially the third position of the uh, codons are usually very free. Anything can come, so it doesn't matter. This third position, you can usually have a much higher degree of freedom to be changed. In that case, you don't have any difference in actually what kind of amino acid will be made out of a particular code is one thing. Another occasion where you don't have any uh, impact is, the first is this redundant code, right? Yeah. The second possibility is, even you have a change in the amino acid, but certain groups of amino acids has a same or similar chemical property. So if you are lucky enough to have this conversion or switching of one particular type of amino acid into another similar type of different amino acid due to this mutation, then overall the function of this protein will not be changed. So you, are, uh, you, you have a lucky break. So with this kind of a small, small degree of freedom to be different, that's how you are able to evolve and then differentiate it to become like this, so different. If not, otherwise, if any of such changes in terms of this, uh, like DNA sequence change in an amino acid, uh, amino acid change uh, during the uh, mutation, then no one, no one with any mutation would have been able to survive and any kind of opportunity to test on their new function they have acquired through this mutation. But thanks to this type of allowance, we have uh, bit by bit, uh, 
like a chance of opportunity to be different. And then some of those differences can somehow uh, display superior uh, functionality. So how uh, that's how we could uh, evolve. Is That's probably more important message out of this mutation. OK. Uh, now we have three different uh, cases, mutation cases that are actual real uh, life examples, and that's all. So why don't we have uh, like some uh, short break during which I can go over a very small number of a particular question and then continue on so that probably definitely we can enjoy early, much early release today. So let's do that.